try that again. Um, good morning. Uh, we're live now. I'm just doing an audio and video check for this morning. Just checking that the audio is okay. Give me an indication on the questions lectures channel. Is anyone out there? Looking for someone to give wonderful. Thank you very much. And just checking the title page is displayed, the week 11 Monday title page. Fantastic. Thanks very much. I'll um I'll mute my video and audio for a few minutes and I'll be back at 9.05.
Okay, good morning all. Um, we should be back online. Um, we'll get underway with the lecture in a moment. Just want to do a one final check to let me know if the audio and video should be good. Wonderful, let's get started. Thanks very much. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's on, if either Brenton or Sarah will be on the questions lectures channel. Uh, not sure they might join us, they might join us later. Um, welcome to week 11, uh, getting towards the business end of the, of the semester. Um, assignment uh, two is well and truly underway. Uh, it was uh, released a week ago and it's due in two weeks time on the 30 on the 31st um content i want to cover with you today is extension material extends the coverage we, we looked at uh one week ago so i'm going to start the lecture with with a recap and then um we'll we'll see where that takes us um so the lecture content is effectively um, a continuation of last Monday's lecture, which seems like a long time ago. Um, and the topic of that lecture was the idea of fitting a straight line to data. It's one of the most common uh, data processing techniques that, that you find in, in engineering, all, all branches of engineering and um, indeed information technology uh, use this idea of taking, taking data and trying to make sense of it. Um, and fitting a straight line to some data to try and uh, extract a pattern or a trend is, as I say, one of the most common techniques that, that there is in data processing. Actually, uh, fitting a straight line to data is actually the first basic step in um, a whole range of uh, what's these days known as machine learning. So the idea with machine learning is to try and extract meaning from data and then to make forecasts from that from that from that meaning uh, and and fitting a straight line to data is 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 the most basic of those basic doesn't mean it's uh completely trivial um but it means it's it's fundamental it's it's the basis on which a lot of data processing and machine learning um, is built and so i want to extend that material last week because it's important and I want to place an emphasis on it for that reason. Um, and I'm going to do a, extend it in a, in a couple of ways, in three ways, actually. The first of which I want to, I want to give you a sense, an idea, the concept of what it means to be the, the line of best fit through some data. We just skated over that last week and I didn't put any detail in that um, uh, deliberately. <laughs> Uh, but today I want to introduce a little bit of detail. Now I have to say that the the uh, the rigorous treatment of least of what's called least squares fitting um, extends well beyond the first exposure course to computing, such as this one. Um, you'll you'll uh, many of you will see least squares applied in in different ways in later years of your study. Uh, but I do think it's possible to introduce you to the concept of what's called least squares fitting. And that's what I wanna to do today. So that's the first extension is to give you an idea of what, what it means to fit, a, to fit a straight line to data. What makes it the best line? Are there other best lines? Um, so the, the, the concept, without, without any mathematics at that, this point, just a, just a visual representation so that at the end of today's lecture, you, you walk away with a sense of what, what least squares means as your first step. The second thing is we're actually going to do a do-it-yourself best straight line fit. Last week, you might remember, we used a curve fit function that was available in a library that came from the Skippy um, um, library. Uh, for, for many engineers, using external functions is, uh, is, is the way to go. Used uh, functions that are, that are tested um, and you're able to use them to solve engineering problems. Another aspect of, of, of engineering problem solving, and certainly in a first course in, 
in engineering computing such as this one is to is to understand the basis of those algorithms and in this case the best straight line fit turns out to be um, reasonably straightforward to do it yourself so i'm going to give you the not just a concept but i'm actually going to give you the underlying equations and also the python code to do a straight line fit to data when i call it do it yourself and uh, it's possible to to take your results, take the results we look at today, and compare them with the with the results that come in from the Skippy library. So um, you've got another a nice a nice check there. And then we're going to so that's the second extension, and the third extension is where we're going to move beyond the straight line fit. Sometimes data isn't well described by a straight line. Sometimes the underlying pattern is more complicated than a straight line. And I want to step you through the uh, how in a first course in computing, you can use Python code to fit a polynomial to some data, maybe a parabola, maybe a cubic. They're important. They're important extensions of this straight line fit. Now, the mathematics of beyond straight line fit gets can get pretty complicated. This is not a course in mathematics; it's a course in computing. And so we're going to use the Skippy library, the curve fit function again to do that to do that fitting uh, and that allows us to, to skirt around the mathematics and solve a problem um, using an external library function and just towards the end of the lecture i want to make a few remarks on the final exam um, i'll have much more to say about the the final exam next week um, the final exam is not until uh, a little over three weeks away and I just want to give you a heads up on what's coming in that exam, what you can expect in, in broad terms. And I'll explain uh, towards the end of the, today's lecture why I'm not giving you that more detailed information at the moment. I'm, I'm withholding it <laughs> just, 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 for, just for a short while, just for a very specific reason. And I want to share that reason with you at the end of today's lecture. But my, my overarching strategy uh, when I'm teaching and certainly teaching this course is to be as upfront with students as I can about, about the format of the exam, what you can expect, um, the way that you'll be assessed, the way the exam will run. I'll give you as much detail as I can. There's just one little technical reason I need to withhold a little bit of that detail at the moment. It'll be shared with you in good time. Keeping in mind, um, this is week 11. Um, the exams run in what's effectively week 14. So you've got three weeks until the final exam and I'll be as upfront as I can with you about the, the format of the final exam. And I'll give you a heads up on that today. Okay, let's get into it. So as a recap, this is uh, an image that you saw in last week's lecture. If you can cast your mind back a week ago. Um, the problem that we are faced with in, in so-called fitting a straight line or straight line fit or finding the, the line of best fit to some data is we're given um, what appear in the, the in the image that you see there as a, a scatter of blue dots. So the underlying thinking is along the x-axis, the horizontal axis, we've got that might be time, for example, it doesn't have to be time, but at some variable, um, the the so-called independent variable along the horizontal axis, and depending on the value of that variable, we've got a measurement that we might make on the vertical axis. And there's clearly an underlying trend here as we move to increasing values of X, we see increasing values of Y. And in this course, we're not interested in the underlying physics or the chemistry or the, the, the underlying explanation. Maybe there is no easy underlying physical explanation, but there's a trend, there's a trend. To the eye, there's a trend. And the trend uh, in this case is a, is a linear one, meaning that there's a straight line um, that can be drawn through the dots that are given as our data. And it's our role to find that line. Now you'll see that the line's not a perfect fit. It's, we've insisted that the, the line through those, through those dots be a straight line. And so only barely a handful of dots fall on that line or close to that line. The others are scattered around. So there's obviously some, some variability of those dots around the line. 
And the goal of fitting a straight line to the data is to obtain the red line, which is the line of best fit. Now with that line of best fit, we can make forecasts about what the Y value would be for any given value of X. Um, and we'll get into some of the interpretation of, um, of that line of best fit in a, in a few slides. The recap from, from a week ago was, and I've given the, line, the name of the, the, the Python file, line fit demo. Um, I've posted that on Blackboard and I've also posted it in the questions lectures channel um, that, you can, that you can run and reproduce those results. And so the idea of fitting a straight line to data is that the in, in, in Python um, is that the input data consists of the X, Y data pairs. So for every X, for every horizontal value, there's a vertical value. Um, and I've indicated that in blue because the, the blue text here on page four corresponds to the blue dots on page three. And our goal is to calculate the line of best fit. The equation for that line, y equals mx plus b, you will have seen at high school and beyond, where m is the gradient and b is the, the y-intercept or the offset. And so that's that, that equation, that straight line equation, y equals mx plus b, describes this line of best fit in the red line that you see on page three. So the goal is to find m and b, because once we've found m and b, we've got a description of a line. So here we have a model that might consist of, in this case, I think it was 100 points. We could have thousands. We could have millions of data points. And the, the idea is to determine two parameters, the M and the B, the gradient, slope of the line, and the offset, where the line intersects the Y-axis. So with those two parameters, we've completely described the red line. So in Python, um, we can use the curve fit function that appears in Skippy Optimize library um, to find the M and the B. And so in the, the gray shaded box that you see there on page four are three lines of code which, uh, which do the work for us. Um, the, there's a curve fit uh, function that comes from the Skippy library and it takes three parameters. It, just, it takes a description of the line and we'll see the detail of that later. This is just an extract. Um, all the, 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 this line function actually appears in the line fit demo Python file. I'm not gonna run it again because I ran it last week. The file's there for you to run should you wish, but this is a, this is a description of a lines um, written as a Python function. So the curve fit function itself takes as its first parameter a function. And then we pass in to the curve fit function, the X and Y arrays, which describe the blue dots here. We describe the X, Y pairs as two separate arrays, an X array and a Y array. And again, I'm not showing you what those arrays are here. You can run them yourself, but I will run this same uh, curve fit algorithm later on a much smaller data set and that in today's lecture, and I there give you what the X and Y uh, data arrays look like. So we call the curve fit function. First parameter is a description of the line written as a Python function. And this, the, the second and third parameters are the X and Y arrays. Now the curve fit function returns two parameters. Each of them is an array. Um, the first of them, P opt, is short for parameter opt. It's the optimal parameters. It's the optimal choice of, um, of the description of the line. And we extract out of that P opt uh, array that's returned by curve fit, the, the, number, the, the values of M and B. And these are the optimal gradient and intercept of the line of best fit. So all the work here is done for us by, curve, by the curve fit function. And so, we, so this P opt square bracket zero means take the p-opt array that's returned by curve fit. The zeroth element of that array is the gradient. The p-opt one parameter, namely the first element of the p-opt array is in fact the offset. And so um, I'll show you this 
this pattern of calling curve fit and then extracting out the parameters um, several times in today's lecture. And in fact, I'm going to show you um, towards the tail end of today's lecture how to use the curve fit algorithm to fit a parabola or how to fit a cubic and importantly how to extract the information from the, the p-opt array that's returned by curve fit. So that's really important. I'm going to emphasize that today. We're going to fit a parabola and a cubic to some data and I'll show you how to extract out the relevant parameters because for the parabola and a cubic we need more than two parameters. We need three or four. And I'll, I'll show you exactly how to do that later in today's lecture. Codes have already been shared with you in Blackboard and Discord. Now, you'll see that so this, this, uh, this syntax for the curve fit function returns two, uh, returns two values, in fact, two arrays. The p-opt one, that's the one we're interested in. Um, it, it contains the gradient and the offset. The curve fit function also returns this second array, p-cov. We're not interested in that um, in this in this course. Um, we need to include it there because the curve fit function is going to return two values, but we just ignore the we just ignore the, um, the the array that's returned. I don't even want to talk about its interpretation. If you're interested, look up the Google the documentation on the curve fit function. I'm not going to talk about what what PCOV is about. It's beyond the scope of this course. The important thing to recognise for this course is that sometimes, and this is, a, this is a perfect example, a function such as curve fit might return two, three, four arguments, and we're only interested in some of them. So it's quite, um, it's necessary to call, to call the function appropriately. In this case, it's got two return arguments, and we just ignore the one that we're not interested in. Okay. Just check, can't see anyone on answering questions, but it looks like there's no questions yet. Okay, good. Now, so that was the recap. Slides three and four, a recap from where we were a week ago. Okay, Oop. recap from where we were a week ago. There's two questions arising, at least two um, from, that, from that recap. How do we define best fit? What is it about that red line that makes it the line of best fit? Now, as it turns out, there's different ways of defining what, what constitutes a best fit. But the one that we're going to use today is overwhelmingly the most common. And it's called the least squares line of best fit. And I'll explain what that terminology least squares means in just a moment. Another question that arises is how do we, even once we've defined what it means for that line to be the best fit, how do we go about calculating the line? Now we know that the curve fit function does the work for us. If we're, we're tasked um, to, to compute the line of best fit, those three lines of code that you see there on slide four will do it for you. Function called a curve fit, extract out the parameters from the, from the, the array that's returned. All good. But it'd be nice to be able to do that fit ourselves, um, both for the, uh, the level of understanding that comes, but actually more for this course. It's because it turns out to be a great little exercise in Python programming, a really nice opportunity to flex your Python muscles and um, and and calculate the the gradient and intercept yourself. And the reason that's nice as a Python exercise is that you can cross check your answer with the results that are turned by the curve fit function. Now you'll know just a little aside on this on the assignment at the moment. There's quite a lot of discussion going on in Discord about how you test your code. And one of the ideas that um, pervades engineering and in fact, information technology too, is the idea of testability of code, knowing how, how do you check that your code is correct um, and having reference cases against which you can test your code against some external library or some external knowledge is, is critical. 
And so the, the reason, one of the reasons I'm including this exercise in, in computing the gradient and intercept M and B directly is because there's, there's a lovely way of computing your answers, cross-checking your answers against the curve fit function. So it's quite satisfying to be given a description of an algorithm, code it yourself, and check that your answers match an external library function. Because then you've got a high degree of confidence that the, the methodology that you're using actually works. And that approach is one we're taking in the second assignment where you're asked to do some image processing and uh, the, the functions that take you backwards and forwards between the two color spaces, you're able to test your code against some reference, some, some, some um, test code that Brenton's provided um, on Blackboard. So you can actually test your answers well in, well in advance of um, um, being, being assessed. So that's just a little bit of high level commentary from me about the uh, code testability. Okay, let's let's turn now to the first the first question here. And the first question was, what defines the line? What what defines best? And I'll put in in, in in inverted commas here. The best straight line is the one that minimizes the size of the inverted commas, the error between the line and the data points. So, if I back up to this slide, you can see there's some variability loosely turned, um, some variability of those dots about the straight line. So this, the best straight line is the one that minimizes the variability. Now, best and error both are both somewhat arbitrary. There's no unique definition of them because once we quantify what the error is, there's different ways of assessing what best means. So both those terms are in inverted commas. And that's fine as a general concept, but it's not good enough for us as engineers. We need to be working with a much greater level of precision um, than, than, this, than inverted commas. So the method I'm gonna show you today is what's called the method of least squares. It goes back, oh, it must be close to four, 350 years at least. Um, it's a very standard approach now in engineering and it's overwhelmingly the most commonly used in engineering. So even if, uh, um, no matter what branch of engineering you're in, um, you will apply uh, it at some point in your studies, um, possibly quite a lot, um, this method of least squares. Um, if you go on to do more advanced study in engineering, um, or if you take courses in machine learning, for example, or, or certainly in statistics, um, this method of least squares is the, is the standard approach on which virtually all other techniques are built. So things like image recognition and artificial intelligence and machine learning, at their heart are all based on, on the method of least squares. Now, I'm not gonna present in this first course on programming, I'm not gonna present all the equations to you for what, what defines least squares, but I do wanna give you the concept. And I think I've got a couple of images here which, which nicely capture what least squares is about. And then we'll turn our mind to the second question about how do we actually compute that line of best fit? So here's, Here's a, a, a conceptual image, and I'm introducing a term here now called residuals. Residuals are what I called on the previous slide, the inverted commas error. So the residuals, if we, for any given line that we fit, any given red line that we fit, we can define the residuals as these vertical gaps between the, where the dotted lines are, that they're the distances between any line that we choose and the data that's given to us. So when you look at this image, what I want you to think is that the black dots are the data that's given, they're given and fixed. And what's variable is the, is the line, the, the gradient and the offset of the line. So if we're given the data, for any given choice of gradient and offset, namely, 
any given choice of red line, we get a different set of residuals because the residuals are the collections of the vertical heights there indicated as the, as the dotted lines. So a line that is a good fit is one that has small residuals. Now we need to be careful when we talk about small residuals because there's a collection of them there and a line that makes one residual small might make another residual large. So we need a way of capturing the set of all the residuals. And there's different ways of doing that, but the method of least squares chooses them in a very particular way. Next slide, I'll give you an illustration of what that means. So for any given line, our goal is to choose the line with the, with the smallest residuals. And I probably should put smallest residuals in inverted commas there because there are different ways of choosing, um, of defining what smallest means. So in this slide, I'm defining what the residuals are. They're the, 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 they're the vertical gaps between the data that's given and any given line. And our goal is to find the best line, the one that makes this, the residuals smallest. Here's what least squares does. Least squares says that for any choice of, well, the, the, the concept of least, let me talk about what the squares mean. Residuals, for each residual, you'll see, I'm gonna rock backwards and forwards between lines seven and eight. In line seven, um, in page seven, I define the residuals. Page eight, I define the squares of those residuals. Notice there's a collection of them because for every, for every data point, there's a, a, a gray square indicated. Now you can think of the gray square as having an area. And the area of a square is the, the, um, the, the, the literally the, the square of, the, of one of its sides. So for any given line, we get a set of residuals and therefore we get a set of areas. And the areas are the area of interest we're interested in is the total area of the gray squares. So this idea of choosing the residuals to be small means that we don't just want one residual to be small and all the others big or all one big and all the others small. We want the, we want the set of residuals to be small in the sense that they're the total area of the gray squares is as small as possible. And the method of least squares gives us a way of calculating the line which makes the total area of the gray squares as small as possible. To use slightly more um, precise terminology, the method of least squares minimizes the sum of the squares of the residuals because the, the residuals are the, these vertical dotted lines. The squares of the residuals are the areas of the associated squares that result from a, a given choice of line. And the method of least squares chooses the red line that minimizes the sum of the squares of residuals, namely the, the total area of those gray squares. So if you walk away from today's lecture with a, with a mental image, this is probably the mental image I want you to walk away with. What does least squares mean? It defines the best fit as being the, the line, which minimizes the total area of the gray squares. Well, that's great. For every choice of M and B, namely for every choice of red line, we can compute the total area of the gray squares. It'll be a fascinating little Python exercise to, if I was to give you a data set and a straight line, M and B, to, to calculate a function, which was to calculate the area of um, those gray squares, the sum of the areas. I'm not gonna do that, but that'd be a fun exercise. Well, that allows us to define what it means to be the method of what the method of least squares is about. But how do we go about finding the best line? The best line is the one that minimizes that sum. Now, 
if you were to do a second or third course on um, numerical methods in engineering, we would be we're actually touching on an area of of um, of mathematics and engineering known as optimization, which is a which is a, a very broad class of techniques which would give us a a method for choosing the M and B to minimise that that total grey area. It's one thing to be able to compute it, but how do we find the line that minimises it? That would be an optimization problem, slightly beyond the scope of this course but very useful for you to know, keep in your head for your future studies. So the problem we face is how do we go about finding the M and the B? Do we have to search over all the M and the B that, and, and for each choice of M and B, compute the area of the gray squares and search around all values of M and B till we find the minimum? And the, the, the fortunate answer is no. There are actually equations for the M and B, which minimizes that total area of the gray squares. And it's the, in fact, uh, you might wonder what's the significance of the squares? Why, why would we square there? Why wouldn't we just look at the size of the, add up the average residual or add up the, 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 the largest residual or, or why wouldn't we just add up the sum of the residuals? Well, the choice of the squares of the residuals means that the, the equations for M and B are, um, are, are simple, or at least in the simplest possible form. And we're, I'm actually gonna give you the equations for M and B um, because they make a, they were a great little activity in writing some Python code and we're gonna write that Python code. And I've already shared it with you on Blackboard and Discord. And as I mentioned before, we can compare our results with the curve fit function in the Skippy library. Now, before I do that, before I present the, uh, the, the equations for M and B, um, those equations use a, a form of notation that you hopefully have seen in mathematics from high school, but maybe not. So the equations for the least squares choice of M and B, the best M and B, is something called sigma notation. And sigma here is a Greek letter. Um, it's uh, the letter for S, the Greek the, the letter, the English equivalent is S. And the sigma notation here denotes a summing up. So you can think of whenever you see a sigma sign, you can see, think of the, the, the first letter in the word sum. It's uh, the uppercase Greek letter for, for S. And this notation that you see on the left, again, many of you will have seen it, but um, some of you may not have. If you see this sigma notation, where we're summing up a bunch of Xs, Xks, and the subscript here, K, runs from zero at the bottom to n minus one at the top. They're the so-called limits of summation. That is a shorthand for x zero plus x one plus dot, 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 dot up to x subscript x n minus one. So the, the index of the first element is indicated in the bottom of the sigma notation. The index of the final element is indicated in the subscript of the final element if we write it out in long form. Now that maps beautifully to Python because we can think of this uh, collection of X values as an array of length N where the X subscript zero maps to the zeroth element of the X array. X subscript one maps to the, um, the index one element of the X array and the final element, the X subscript N minus one is the element with index N minus one. So the, the Python terminology here maps perfectly to the, to the underlying um, mathematical notation. And because it's an array and we're doing something iteratively, it maps perfectly to the use of a for loop. So we can use a loop to calculate this sum if we ever needed such a sum. So we, we know we can use for K in range zero to, to N means for K running over the range of values zero, the first element of the uh, argument to the range function up to the element before N, um, so N minus one. So I'm presenting this uh, sigma notation to you before. You may have seen it before. I'm recapping it if you have. If you haven't seen it before, 
nothing to be scared about. It's a shorthand um, for, uh, for, the, for the long form here. And I'm introducing it with, because in using sigma notation, the expressions for M and B um, appear in their simplest form and they're very easily, or they're straightforward to map into, into Python code using arrays and for loops. And we're gonna do that with a, we're gonna actually uh, write the code, test it and demonstrate it with a, a simple, with a, with a small example. And the input data in, for, in the general case for the straight line fit to the problem is N pairs of X, Y's. And here we're gonna use X subscript and Y subscript to denote the, the, the pairs, the ordered pairs of, of numbers. These are, the, these are the, the X, Y coordinates of the blue dots that are our given um, data set. And the simpler, the example I'm gonna look at here comes from um, a property of a physical property of uh, electrical conductors. Doesn't matter if you don't know anything about electrical conductors, that's not the point. But um, electrical resistance R depends on temperature in, in, a, in a particular way. And if you look at the, the data that's given, this, would, this is data that's um, come from a, a, a measurement data set that says at, at, at a given temperature, um, the electrical resistance is, is measured there, um, is, is given in that small table. So we're actually gonna solve a problem that's got N equals five um, data points. And you can see by I that as the temperature goes up, so too does the electrical resistance. And um, temperature's measured in degrees Celsius there and R's in units of something called ohms. Again, doesn't matter if you're not familiar with um, electrical resistance, it's just a physical quantity and I'm giving you the, the X, Y pairs here. So I've given it to you in the form of a table where the first column is the temperature, second column is the electrical resistance and we're going to use X and Y arrays to, um, to describe our problem here. Again, simple little, not a, a simple, it's a common uh, strategy in, in, in computing when we're given physical quantities like T and R to map them to variables that we're more comfortable writing our programs in terms of, in this case, X and Y. So you can sort of see the trend, increasing temperature results in increasing um, resist electrical resistance. That trend is really apparent if you plot the points. And I've plotted the data here as five blue points. On the x-axis is the, is the temperature in degrees Celsius. And on the y-axis is the electrical resistance measured in ohms. Now, I'm not gonna share with you in the lecture slides the whole code for this LS, the least squares, uh, line fit data Python program, but I have shared it with you in Blackboard and Discord. So you can run it yourself if you like. The reason I'm not sharing it with you is that the code to generate these dots is actually a subset of code that I'm going to step through with you in a few slides. So you can see here where we define the, the X data, it's the temperature, 20.5, 32.7 and so on up to 95.7. It's the first column of the data here. And the second, the second array, the Y array, it's a NumPy array, um, it's the uh, measured electrical resistance ranging from 765 up to 1032. And there it is in tabular form on page 11. So there we are, that's our data set. And clearly by eye, there's a linear, there's a linear trend there. Increasing temperature um, maps to electrical resistance going up. Doesn't explain why it happens. It's just a, an observed fact. So that's a particular problem. What I'm gonna do now is present a couple of slides of the general setting, and then we'll apply our general setting to the problem, the specific problem of finding the line of best fit through these five data points. So our aim in, in this least squares straight line fitting is to find the gradient and the, and the, um, the offset. I've indicated them here in bold font to try and make them a bit, of a, bit more visually obvious, we're trying to find M and B, which, which puts the straight line through the, the, the observed data um, 
uh, makes it the best line in the least square sense in, in the sense of minimizing those rectangles. Now I've introduced two quantities here on this slide. This is not the equations. The equations for the M and B come on the next slide. But what you see on this slide are two expressions that will appear in those equations. And they are, I've indicated them here as X bar and Y bar. And you might recognize them as being the averages or the means of the X and Y arrays. So for the example of the equation for X bar, it's the sum of the X values divided by the number of the values. So it's the average. And I've, I've written them here in, in uh, red and blue, simply because on the equations that appear on the next slide, I want you to be able to see them and recognize them for what they are, and then focus on the rest of the equations. And then because we're gonna map those equations into Python code. Okay, so uh, our first step, if we were given a data set, would be to compute the averages of the X and the Ys independently. And here's the equations for the, for the base best straight fit line. And in terms of equations, this is probably the most complicated equation that we've seen in this course. And so I need to step through it with you carefully because this is not a course about mathematics, it's a course about computer programming. And so on slide 14, I've deliberately included at the top of the page, you can see these equations for the, the optimal choice of M, the, the line gradient, and the optimal choice of B, the line offset. And then, so the, the top half of the page is the equations. The bottom half of the, the page is the Python code, which implements those equations. So you can see on one slide, what the mapping is between the code on the bottom and the equations at the top. And if you look at the equations, let's look at the equation for M. It's a fraction. And in the numerator of the fraction, we have a summation. We saw the summation notation earlier before with the sigma. It's a sum of products. And each of those products is the gap between the kth element of the X array and the average of the X array. The product of that term with the kth element of the Y array and the average value of the Y array. And you can see here now that the X bars and Y bars have been presented in um, red and blue fonts, just to sort of draw your eye to their, to their existence, knowing that they're easily computed. And then the denominator of the equation is a summation again, and this time it's a sum of squares, and it's the sum of the gap between the X's and the average value of the X's squared. So the denominator is what's called the sum of squares. It's a summation of terms, and each of the terms is a squared value, the gap between the kth value and the average of all the, all the values in the X array. And then, so that's the M, it's a ratio of two quantities. So you can, even before you look at the code, if you were given that equation, you'd be thinking, okay, I need a for loop to compute the numerator and a for loop to compute the denominator. And in fact, the code at the bottom of the page uses the same for loop to calculate both, both terms separately. Once we've computed M, computing the, the B, the, the offset is straightforward. It's the average value of the Y array minus the M that we've just calculated times the average value of the X array. So they're the equations. Let's look at the code. We've got, um, in the first line of code, we compute the length of the arrays. We're gonna need that length later in line. In fact, we'll need that length in line six. In lines two and three, we, can, we use the NumPy mean function in order to compute the average value of the X and Y arrays directly. So X bar is NumPy mean X. That's the implementation of the the equation with the red X on page 13. Similarly, Y bar, it's the equation for the, 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 the blue Y bar equation um, that you see on page 13. So that was our preliminary step. And then in lines uh, six, seven, and eight, we compute the running, su the, the sums. So you'll you remember before when we saw the Sigma notation, 
running from zero up to n minus one, here we have a for loop running from zero up to n minus one. And because we're going to compute running sums, we've got m num, which is the numerator, and m den, which is the denominator. We need to initialize those to, to be zero. So this is a, a programming pattern that we see again and again and again. We'll be computing running sums and we need to initialize before the loop starts. And then if we look at lines seven and eight of the code, which is the really the heart of com these computations, we can see the numerator is the running sum of the product of two terms, one of which is xk minus x bar. And it's about as close as you can get to, from between mathematics and Python. Here's xk minus x bar written in Python form, highlighted on page on line seven. Here's xk minus x bar in, in mathematical notation. And that's, that's uh, multiplied by yk minus y bar. And here we have yk minus y bar in the numerator. The denominator is slightly simpler. It's an accumulation. It's a running sum of the squared values of xk minus x bar. Here it is in maths. Here it is on line eight in Python code. And once that loop's finished, we've computed the running sums from zero up to k up to n minus one. We can comp compute m is the ratio of those two terms, the numerator divided by the denominator. So that's line line nine and line ten. The final line of the code is b is equal to y bar minus mx bar. Again, about as close as ma a mapping as you can get between mathematics highlighted here in blue and the Python code highlighted here in blue on line 10. Now, this is only a code fragment because what I want to do is show the algorithm running and then we'll look at the, the whole code in its totality. But this is where the action happens. This is the this is our do-it-yourself uh, calculation of the gradient and offset in the best least squares. Um, line of fit. So here's what happens when we run the code. We get a straight line that visually looks looks like it certainly um, describes the data uh, well. And using the, the code, we get that the gradient M is 3.39 and the offset is 702. And I've actually written that in, in the code the code that I've shared with you on the following pages, but also in Blackboard and Discord, um, the, the code actually writes the, the line of best fit equation in the, in the title of, the, of the, um, the, the graph. So we can run it, least squares line fit. Just make sure we've got the, And here's, our, here's the, there's the, um, the graph that I shared with you in the lecture slides. You can reproduce it yourself from the, from the code. So if we look at that code itself, um, lines 11 through to 20, I shared with you on page 14 of the lecture notes precedes those lines is the um, importing of the NumPy and matplotlib functions for calculations and plotting. Here we've got our all important definition of the line. I'll show you where that's used in a moment. Then we define our, our arrays. You've seen line seven and eight before because they were, they were actually the definition of the data points. And then in line nine, we actually plot the data. So in fact, uh, those lines that I've highlighted there in fact, if you were to run the, the first nine lines of the code, that would produce the, just the plot of the dots themselves. Lines 11 through the, through the 20 are the do-it-yourself line fit. And from thereafter, it's just a plot. There are just plot commands. Plotting the, plotting the, the red line of best fit and displaying the results in the title and putting some labels on. So most of the action, the computational action for this course uh, for this, this code is in lines 11 through to 20. OK, 
okay. That's our straight line of best fit. Here's the Python code. Um, I don't need to go over these pages because I've just described to you what I've done. It, it's a commentary on the line on the code itself. As with all these code examples, the best thing that you could do in follow up to this lecture is to run the code. Step one, reproduce the results that I've included in the in the um, in the lecture notes uh, and, 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 and stay, step two, start modifying the code, um, change some of the X values, uh, change some of the Y values, see if you get different lines of best fit um, and just experiment. The other thing we can do to test this code is to um, use the curve fit function that we saw last week and that I recapped at the start of today's lecture. We're gonna obtain identical results using the curve fit function. And if we were to do that, what we would do is replace lines one to 10 on the previous slide. Um, sorry, lines one to 10 on, on um, page 14, when it says that on the, on the earlier slide rather than the previous slide. Remember the, 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 the do-it-yourself version finished up with values of M and B. And here we've got the call to curve fit, which does the whole thing in three lines for us. It's no surprise that when we call an external function, we get a simpler or shorter implementation. In the curve fit function, all the details hidden away from us, we can use it, we can look at it if we like, we don't have to. In the do-it-yourself version, all the equations are built into the code in these lines one and 10. Okay, so this, it is correct actually. The lines one to 10 on the previous slide, meaning this slide, we could just replace them with these three lines here. And um, I won't, I've actually got a complete script which does that for you. And I think I've posted it in Blackboard and Lecture Code. I'm just thinking now whether I did or not. I should have, if I didn't, um, it'll be there after the lecture and you can run the code and confirm that you get exactly the same, the same answers. So stepping back from this particular example, if you've written do-it-yourself code and the results match with a reference library, one that you are told is correct or have a high degree of confidence in, then you're pretty confident that your implementation is correct. Okay, final piece of the lecture content today. Everything we've said so far since we started fitting lines to data, the unstated but implicit assumption was that data is well described by a straight line. That was obvious in the examples we saw earlier and it was uh, including the, the resistance which depended on temperature in a linear fashion. In fact, there's some good physics to explain why resistance would depend on temperature in a linear fashion. Okay, what happens if we've got a data set that's not well described by a straight line and we still want a, a simple description of it? So the data set that you see there is clearly not in a straight line. And so trying to find the line of best fit would be possible. It just wouldn't be a very um, powerful or insightful model. It wouldn't be a very accurate model for forecasting the, the vertical value Y for a given value of X. So there's definitely cases in engineering and beyond where we want to fit a, a, a simple line of some form to a data set, even if it's not a straight line. And the good news is that the method of least squares also provides answers to those sort of questions. How do you fit other simple lines? Well, the simplest possible line that would be not a straight line would be a parabola. Does that look like a parabola to you? Doesn't look like one to me because you wouldn't expect that kink. Parabola would be either a you know, um, um, dish shaped up or dish shaped to the right or dish shaped down or to the left. Doesn't look like a parabola, but we could attempt to do that. A cubic polynomial gives us more flexibility. Notice how we go, when we move to other curves, we've got more values to find. With a straight line, we needed to find the gradient and the offset. 
with a parabola, we need to find these coefficients A, B, and C. With a cubic polynomial, we need to find the, the coefficients A, B, C, and D in the expression for the cubic polynomial. See, they're the coefficients of the x cubed, the x squared, the x in the linear term. And we can keep going with higher order polynomials, order four and five and so on. So one of the one of the one of the nice features about the, the the principle of least squares is that it applies to these more complicated functions too. There are also some um, some tricks and some um, some limitations. They're beyond the scope of this course. But the really nice thing about a uh, curve fit function in Python is it also works with other so-called nonlinear functions. These ones that are parabolas and cubics and higher order, they're nonlinear. They're not a straight line, literally non-linear. Um, things like exponential functions or trigonometric functions or weird and wonderful functions like e to the minus x squared. Um, each time there's a, at least one coefficient to identify, b, c, or d, and so on. So the curve fit function, let's forget about the do it yourself it's way too complicated for these nonlinear functions, but Python allows us to solve those problems um, quite, quite readily. And again, behind the scenes, it's actually using the concept of least squares. So least, least squares applied to this data set would fit a, would fit a curve, the, the specification that we give it with the so-called degrees of freedom a, B, C, A, B, C, D, and so on. And the, the curve fit function inside would use the method of least squares to, um, to search for values of those parameters, which minimize the square, the area of the, the associated um, squares, the, 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 gray, the gray squares that are result from the residuals. Keeping in mind that for example, like this, I think there's a hundred data points. Um, the, there'd be a hundred gray squares and we'd have to compute the sum of the areas of those for each choice of A and B and C and D. So it gets quite complicated. What's going on? What It's actually quite sophisticated. And yet the call to curve fit will allow us to do that in a very straightforward fashion. All sounds pretty easy. There's two issues we need to deal with. One of which I've already, I've already mentioned before. Uh, least squares curve fitting with complicated high order nonlinear functions, it's tricky and it's possible to get stuck at the wrong value of the, of the parameters. That, that's tricky, can't avoid that. It's beyond the scope of this course. That's the first issue. The second one, which is the one I do want you to think about, is that sometimes you need some physics or some creativity, or I'll be honest, some engineering intuition or even some guesswork in order to find the right model to fit. When the data is given to you like this, you would try and, and you wanted a, a simple description, you would, you would have to use your intuition, your, your uh, engineering creativity to choose a model that's appropriate. And you would generally start, it's as a general principle that pervades engineering is you use the simplest model possible. So if it were me, and I'm gonna do this with you live in a moment, if it were me, I'd start with trying to fit a parabola and see how that went. Fit a cubic, see how that went. Fit, a, fit, a, fit an order four, would that, would that do any better? And we could go on in that way. So here, we're stepping beyond fitting a straight line. We're going to fit these higher order or nonlinear functions. And this is where our engineering intuition needs to come into play. It's all very well to have the curve fit function find the, the best values of the, these unknowns, A, B, C, or A, B, C, D. But Python's not going to tell us which of those functions is the best one to use. And in many cases, there's not really a best function. It's one that has the, is the simplest, but which sufficiently 
accurately captures the data. And so what I've done here is I've created um, a simple illustration of that for you. I've got the data set in the blue line, in the blue dots that you see there, is exactly the data set that we displayed here. And I've done that by choosing the random number seed um, explicitly. And I'll share that code with you in a moment. So you, again, you can reproduce the results that you see in the lecture notes. So the blue dots, we might start by saying, well, it's not going a straight line's not gonna work. What about a parabola? And you sort of know by looking at it that it doesn't look like a parabola. So the parabola is not gonna fit very well. Um, we can ask curve fit to find the best ABC, which matches the data. And the red line that you see there is in fact the segment of a parabola, which best fits that data. So what's the lesson you take away from, from this? Curve fit's not gonna do magic for you. If the data is not well described by a parabola, the Python, the, the Skippy library function curve fit, can't do anything about that. It'll find the best A, B and C and there they are. You can see in the, in the title of the, the slide here, the title of the graph, the best A is 2.87, it's the coefficient of X squared. The best B is minus 13.76. Here it is, the coefficient of X, and the best C is 7.3. Curve fit's done, the, done, the, done its best. It can't find any better A, B, and C. It's just that the data's not well described by a parabola. So what about a cubic? How about that? In this case, the data really is well described by a cubic. And so again, the curve fit function A, B, C, D finds the the best parameters, four point, minus 4.07, 2.87, 2.26.07 and 7.3. They are the values, the best values of A, B, C and D, which fit the red curve, the, the red uh, cubic polynomial to the data points in blue. Now, clearly I've created a, a data set here, which matches this, um, the cubic polynomial very well. In fact, you'll see in a moment, what I did was I generated the blue dots by taking a cubic polynomial and adding some noise to it. That was what created the variability. So this would be um, an example that's very simplistic for realistic applications, but I think it illustrates well the point that I'm trying to make here, which is that the fact that curve fit doesn't seem to have done a very good job here, it's not a fault of curve fit. It's a, it's a, um, a reflection of the fact that the data is not well described by a parabola. Okay, so let's look at the code. Um, in fact, let's run it. Let's, uh, let's run it first. It's probably a bit better. And then you can look at the code as, as reference. This is nonlinear guess one. Let's have a look. Let's look at the code. Nonlinear guess one. Okay. Here it is. At the top, we've got our import lines. I want to go over those. Here in lines seven and eight is a function definition called parabola. This is the first time since we started, we started uh, using the curve fit function a week ago. Up until now, the, 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 the function that was passed to the curve fit function has always been a straight line. It, it returns AX plus B. Here's the first time that's not been the case. This time, if you look down at line 16, that's the key line. This is line 16 is the key line of this program. It's where we pass in, we call the curve fit function. We pass in the XY data, the blue dots, and we pass in a description of the line 
we are seeking to fit to the data. And so line 16, absolutely central line of this code. We pass in a description of the line we're attempting to fit to the XY code, the XY data points. And here you see in line seven and eight, a description of, the, of that line. And it really is returning AX squared plus BX plus C for, for the particular value of X and, the, and any choice of ABC. And so what the curve fit function does is actually search around for the, the best A, B and C, which um, minimize the least squares. But that's beyond what we need to know. All we need to do is be able to call the curve fit function. Again, it returns two, two, two return arguments, P, P opt, the one we're interested in, and P cov. Let's ignore P cov, not interesting to us. But P opt is, and notice that P opt is an array now that returns, um, I've put all the values on, on one line on line 17. I've done that so that the Python code in the lectures in the lecture slides fits onto a single page. And I can do that by separating these statements with a semicolon, but that's not the main point. The main point is that now, because we've called curve fit with a parabola, the parabola has three degrees of freedom, the A, the B, the C, AX squared plus BX plus C. And so our job then as programmers is to take the P op to the return by curve fit and to extract out the three values we're interested in, A, B, and C. And it's no accident that, that A is P opt zero, B is P opt one, and C is P opt two. It's no accident that that is the same order as the function which defines the parabola. And the lines from there on just plot the, let's just, just plot the, um, plot the, plot the, uh, the, the best fit parabola and also plot a title for this. So let's run that code now. Run nonlinear guess one. It's the first nonlinear function and we're taking, at the first guess is a parabola and there it is. Again, you've seen it in the lecture notes, but it's, you're able to reproduce it in Python yourself. And so the, the, the values that are displayed up in the title are A, B and C they've been returned by the curve fit function. They're the best fit. It's just not, the parabola is just not a great fit to the data. Let's try a second function, which is nonlinear guess two. It's exactly the same. Um, it, it looks almost exactly the same as the, the as nonlinear guess one. And that's the point. The only changes I had to make between trying to fit a parabola and trying to fit a cubic, I had to change the definition of the, the curve that I was attempting to fit. This time, it's AX cubed plus BX squared plus CX plus D, where we've got the, the values A, B, C, and D are to be found. And line 16, the only difference from the fitting a parabola is that this time we pass in a description of the cubic function, order three. And line 17 gets a little longer because now we've got four parameters to extract from the p-opt array. p-opt zero, p-opt one, p-opt two, p-opt three. They are the values of A, B, C, and D that are calculated by the curve fit function. So now if we run this function, nonlinear guess two, we get that lovely fit to the data. Values of A, B, C, and D are described up in the title of the, of the slide. So what you'll notice is uh, I deliberately skipped over it because I had to generate the data somehow for the, for the program to fit. And you'll see here in lines 12 and 13 that I generate a sequence of X points between minus four and four, a hundred of them. And here in line 11 is actually a cubic polynomial, minus four X cubed plus three X squared plus 25 X plus six. The values aren't 
particularly important other than they just produce a nice curve for display. Plus some normal or, ran or Gaussian random noise. And I've just set the parameters here, the, the mean and the, the standard deviation. I've just chosen the, the standard deviation just so I got enough variability so that it looked like a good, a good curve to fit. And so that was the code for the parabola fit, some commentary. The, the code for the, the, the cubic fit only had to um, vary in a, in a couple of critical ways. We defined a different function, uh, the cubic function rather than the parabola and the call to curve fit uh, referred to that cubic function rather than the parabola and, um, and returned four values rather than three. Let's step back. If you, if you, uh, what we've actually done in fitting both a cubic and a parabola to those data points is really powerful to be able to, to attempt to fit a parabola and then fit a cubic uh, with just a couple of lines of code change is really powerful. Now, if the data set was, was more complicated again, how we, would, how we would go about exploring how to fit a better model, again, would rely on our engineering um, judgment. We could go to higher order models, order five, order six, order seven, and so on. But generally speaking, those models get a bit complicated because they get five, six, seven, eight parameters to fit. Um, it's also possible to use the curve fit function to fit other types of nonlinear functions, as I said, decaying exponentials, sine waves, more exotic functions. Um, I haven't done that here because I don't want to emphasize that. What I do want to emphasize is that if you were to be given a data set consisting of a, um, a collection of um, X, Y points, uh, what I would expect you to be able to do with a little bit of practice is use the code given to you here in nonlinear guess one and its extension in guess two to be able to fit a low order polynomial, a parabola, a cubic, and to be able to go through the process of defining those functions and then calling the curve fit function to perform the, the, curve, the curve fit. So I haven't gone on to the more exotic nonlinear functions because um, I've illustrated the point of taking nonlinear functions and, and fitting data to them. And certainly with a bit of practice, I'd expect you to be able to, to do similar, either fit a cubic, fit a polynomial, a, a, a parabola, or something like that to a, to, to, to a simple data set. So the curve fit function in, in the Skippy library really is a very, a very powerful one for us, powerful tool for engineers to be able to use. And that's really where I wanted to get to today with lecture content. Um, we extended the, the, the least squares line fitting in three ways. I gave you the, a, a visual image of what, of what least squares is about, these gray, these gray squares, what, what the concept of least squares is. Haven't proved anything. Um, that's, that's beyond the scope of this course, but it's quite often the case for engineers where you get given equations and you need to write computer code that implements them. And um, that was the second step in today's lecture, the second extension where we actually did a do-it-yourself straight line fit and we're able to reconcile our results with the, with the curve fit function. And then the third step today was to, to go beyond the straight line fit um, to give you the, the tools and the confidence to be able to fit, say, a parabola or a cubic to, some, uh, to a data set that was given to you. So that's the that's the end of that's the conclusion of the the lecture content. Let me say just a few words about the exam. Uh, the exam will take place on Tuesday, the eighth of June. From memory, it's a two p.m. start. The way that that exam is going to run is that it's going to run on Blackboard, so that you will have uh, one hundred and thirty minutes to complete the questions in Blackboard and then post your answers to Blackboard and they'll be subsequently graded. 
130 minutes sounds a bit strange. If you like to think of it as um, enough time for a, a two hour exam, plus some upload time, because part of the part of the exam will be you uploading either code or um, a plot or both. Um, and there's a little bit of upload time. So when we've written the exam, we've written it so that as, as if it was a two hour exam um, with a bit of with a bit of um, uh, with a bit of upload time. Um, so again, it's going to be done on Blackboard and you'll submit your answers to Blackboard. Um, the only I'll have I'll have a lot more to say about the makeup of the particular questions of the exam uh, next week, probably on Thursday. Um, but uh, I, I, the reason is that uh, that I'm being cagey about the number of questions is that uh, we have written a four question exam. Four questions. Um, So I'm just, just distract, distracted. Okay, four questions. That uh, uh, what happens is we've submitted that that exam, um, and there'll be some processing of it by the examinations team, not us. What that might mean is that uh, the exam that we wrote might get broken into more questions. Might the the individual questions might be broken into smaller questions in order to fit into the blackboard format. That's all I'm saying. I don't know how that split's going to happen. I don't know if that split's going to happen. But if you were to be sitting in front of a paper exam, four questions, roughly half an hour each, two-hour exam, some time for up for Blackboard upload of um, of Python code or some or some um, plot outputs, something like that. I'll say more about the format of the exam next week, and there'll be discussion. I'll create a channel that we can have discussion on on Blackboard um, on Discord rather about the about the nature of the exam, but I don't want to. I don't want to do that here. I just want to sort of, if anything, I just want to get the discussion going. Uh, we're still three weeks out from the exam, so there's plenty of time. Um, the exam's not till the eighth of June, as I mentioned before. Uh, I just want to get you thinking about it. Prompt those questions. We'll take them up online on on Discord. Uh, I've just started to field enough questions about what's coming up in the exam to know that students are anxious about the exam. I get that. Um, and so we'll get the discussion happening now. Once we've got clarity on exactly the way that the exam is going to be formatted on Blackboard, I'll share those details with you too. But if you want to have a, a mental image in your, in your head, four questions, roughly half an hour each, and you submit answers to Blackboard, it'll start at 2pm on Tuesday, the 8th of June. You get two hours plus a bit of upload time, so 130 minutes in total. Okay, that's all the content I have for you today. Um, uh, don't forget we've got Assessed Lab Three, which is going to run in the the face to face labs this this week. Um, we've made it. We've deliberately chosen the the Assessed Lab for this week um, to be uh, as uh, we've been as clear as possible about what what our expectations are because we know that. Uh, you probably have other other course assessments piling up. Um, you've got an exam which is not too far around the corner, and you're working on a 15% assignment. So we've deliberately chosen this week's assessed lab to be to have our expectations as as, as clear as possible about that. Um, so uh, the assignment's due in two weeks. Exams in three weeks. Um, until we catch up again on Thursday afternoon, I'll say 